Hi, I'm Tom Woods, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome back to the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm your host, Doug Stewart, and I'm going to share with you today a roundtable video, which is a feature that we've done on YouTube for about a year now. About every two weeks, we get together and discuss the news of the day and assess it from a libertarian Christian perspective. And we actually featured the Liberty Memes page founder, David Gay, whose in-laws are Cuban refugees and who wanted to join us to talk about the incredible changes and protests that are happening in Cuba We thought it was an important enough topic that was timely that we wanted to also share with our podcast audience. But if you have not visited our YouTube channel, you can do that. You can visit our website. You can see a link to our YouTube channel on the homepage. And you can go watch a lot of our YouTube videos. So if you want to know like what we think about current events, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. But we also thought that this particular content would be really useful for our podcast listeners. This happens to be a Zoom recorded episode, so the typical audio quality is not going to be quite as strong as what you might expect. But of course, we hope you forgive us based on the content and the method we had to use to acquire it. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to another edition of Good News, Bad News, the Libertarian Christian Institute's roundtable for YouTube. And uh, we are really happy to be joined for a special edition of the roundtable today. We are joined by David Gay, who is the founder of Liberty Memes. And he's here to talk to us a little bit about Cuba. But before we go into the topic, David, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and where we can find you on the net and just all of that. So for the uninitiated, Liberty Memes kind of came out of the Ron Paul revolution. Peter and I, my brother Peter, who is also the founder of Reformed Libertarian, the group on Facebook, we decided that we should keep the revolution going in our own way. (laughs) And so we decided that viral memes would be very effective at continuing the message online. We ended up being the largest collection of liberty-minded memes on the internet until one day, October 18th, 2000. 18, I believe, Facebook decided, guess what? Pages like yours aren't allowed to exist anymore. We had well over half a million followers. I'm pretty sure that the way our viral content was going at the time, we would have reached a million in no time. We replaced it. We started new pages. Those got 80,000 likes, 30,000 likes, 20,000 likes. We've had plenty of, you know, we can always rebuild our audience. I've never been worried about that. It's still annoying to have to do that though because it does get in the way of spreading the message effectively. But even despite that, Liberty Memes over the last three years has helped raise, and this is documented, has helped raise over $250,000 for people in need. And it's like people who come to us and say, hey, my car battery, I need a car battery. I've got a (laughs) flat tire," Or something extreme like, I'm going to get kicked out of my house for they're going to foreclose on my mortgage and our group will come together and say, hey, we'll just pay up everything that you owe on your mortgage and buy you the rest of your house. And maybe surgeries, medicines. And we do this in the name of voluntarism. And it's because we don't believe that it's enough to sit back on our rhetoric and say, hey, we know that if we get rid of the welfare system, that suddenly the private market will take care of everybody. We don't believe that we should just leave it as an abstract concept and that we should be proving in real time that it works right now. So we have a group called Liberty Memes $5 Charity Club on Facebook where we do those things. So awesome. that's usually my focus. But because my wife is a political refugee from Cuba and because I've worked with the Cuban community pretty much since 1994, consistently every day, this issue of Cuban liberty right now and our fight in general against global communism and our fight against what the Cuban government is doing to their people and what they're doing around the world is really taking priority right now for me. Well, and we're certainly glad that you have taken it upon yourself, you and your brother and others, of course, to found Liberty Means and you guys have had such a great effect and we're really thankful that you guys exist. So, you know, our hearty applause for you guys and keep it up. It's amazing. I mean, people think it's ridiculous. Uh, (laughs) It's just a memes page is what people like to say. But I tell people, you know, 
if it was just a meme stage, they wouldn't be so afraid of what we're posting. That's right. Uh-huh. That's right. Nothing right. like the power of the memes. That's right. <laughs> well, we've got a we've got our crack team assembled here tonight to discuss what you just mentioned as well. This amazing series of events happening in Cuba, and I think that you know perhaps to set the stage, kind of let's start at maybe the beginning. Let's learn a little bit about the Cuban situation, and we've got uh, you know our. our admin from our Libertarian Christian Institute page, Aaron Cuevas here, to discuss it as well. And so just, guys, lay it on us. Like, a bunch of us are going to be totally ignorant about what's been really happening. So teach us. I could start all the way at the beginning. There was a (laughs) a brutal dictator in Cuba named Fulgencio Batista, but he went by the moniker of being a capitalist. And So they had to get rid of that guy because he was a brutal dictator. But along with that name capitalist, they had to have some sort of a system to counter that. So they were like, well, we're not him. So we're the complete opposite. So we're also communist. That's really bad. (laughs) Um, But Cuba has been a communist country for 62 years, a brutal dictatorship. My father-in-law was in a concentration camp called UMAP. And this is forced labor because when the communists took control, when Ernesto Che Guevara actually took control of the Cuban economy, they nationalized the sugarcane industry because they said that it was exploitative to the workers. Mm -hmm. So they nationalized the industry and production went down to like 10%. And Cuba at the time relied 100% on their sugar exports. So they needed to supplement what they had lost by nationalizing the industry. So they abducted people who were undesirable and made them slaves. So I'm not sure which system was more exploitative (laughs) I wonder. (laughs) Yeah. So my father-in-law was tortured in that camp. A lot of people were summarily executed around him. He did perform several acts of uh, bravery to save people from torture while he was in the camp. So I could get into that if if you'd like. But also my mother-in-law was neglectfully murdered by Schrodinger's healthcare system. It's, yeah, it's a beautiful and awesome and advanced healthcare system and they have it you need. But at the same time, they're also in the, pro- in the streets right now protesting because they don't have everything they need. So that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's a beautiful hmm. healthcare system and it's free for everybody, like the mayor of Washington, D.C. just posted today on Instagram. But at the same time, my wife's mother was neglected to the point of death from a treatable condition that just could have been treated with penicillin because her husband was a political dissident and had been a political prisoner. Hmm. And meanwhile, the doctors who had a Hippocratic oath, like every doctor at the time, I don't know if they still do that in Cuba. I know they don't do it in China anymore. But the doctors were marching around the hospital, and this is like in the mid 80s, late 80s, dressed like military, saying, Well, right now we don't get to work as doctors. Right now we have to defend the hospital from the Yankee invasion. And this is rural, <laughs> this is rural tobacco land Cuba. This isn't Havana. This isn't Santiago. This isn't Villa Clara. This isn't one of the major cities. This is rural Pinar del Rio where there's like caves where the Indians still live and and tobacco. Now, that's an exaggeration. Indians don't still live there, but there is a place called Cueva del Indio in Pinar del Rio and it's a beautiful tourist place. But they let her die because her husband wasn't in the party. And this is what's going on today. You know, the Cuban government has receives from the United States over $200 million every single year in produce imports, in medicine imports. In fact, the OFAC, the Treasury Department, grants special permission for anything that's agricultural or medicinal headed to the island. So this whole idea that an embargo is standing in the way of them getting what they need is just absolute nonsense. It's only about trade with major, with like, with businesses. So the Cuban people get food and medicine straight from the United States all the time. But I shouldn't say the people. The yeah. party gets these the party things. Gets. The party gets a hold of these things. So, so it's the U.S. government is propping up the communist regime? I, I, well, <laughs> I, I guess you, you got ahead a little bit, but yes. Oh. <laughs> um, so Joe Biden, for example, this week, the first thing that he announced that he was going to do in response to the alleged shortages in Cuba because of the embargo or because of whatever, because the media is painting us out to be a protest about the embargo and saying that we're protesting because of a lack of vaccines and all this stuff. So Biden said, I'm going to make it easier for people to send remittances. 
<laughs> that was his, that was his first solution as president. I'm going to make it easier for everybody to send remittances. They already send remittances. Those yeah. remittances go to the party, you know. And and they're just like, well, we're going to make it easier for them to get, you know, the people to get it and restrict the party from getting a hold of it. That's not a thing that's actually that's not living in reality. Jeez. There's no way to keep there's no way to keep the resources of the Cuban people out of the hands of the government because the Cuban government has taken Cuba as their own farm of humanity. You know, Cuba has abundant agricultural resources themselves that Cuban people are not allowed to touch. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a tropical paradise in terms of you, you know, you can grow mangoes and papayas and avocados and and you can raise animals, but not a single person in Cuba, which is a very rural country, not a single person owns a cow. The government owns all the cows. The government owns all the milk. Even if you're a dairy farmer, you're not allowed to take any of that milk. So nationalized industry by the government is yeah. the, much of the source of the pain of the people. At that point. Yeah, so, so the second solution that the Biden people had, and he announced this today, was that he's going to make it so that America can seize the assets of any Cuban official who's found guilty of a human rights abuse. <laughs> and it's so it's so ambiguous, and and they've got the, the the Democrats in the Cuban community already kind of celebrating. They're like, "All right, he's on the same page with us. He's against the dictatorship." And I'm like, "Guys, he's just trying to pacify you with crumbs. Mm-hmm. We want an end to the Cuban communist regime. We want the United States to get out of the way so that people can help their families in Cuba without risking jail time in the United States for having gone there." Yeah. So he says. Well, we're gonna we're gonna start sanctioning these people from Cuba. I'm like, how are you going to prove these human rights abuses if at the same time our television is telling us that there's only been one person killed in these protests? Which is an undoubtedly a lie. <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay, you're gonna wait until we have a war crimes tribunal or until the, the CIA determines that somebody committed an abuse. What what are we gonna wait for here? It's so ambiguous. It's so it's impossible to immediately apply. So there are no immediate actions being taken for Cuba. Meanwhile, CNN will go and they'll cover the counter protests <laughs> that are people demanding an end to the Cuban embargo. There are people who are saying, oh, this is all just the CIA created this. I'll tell you who created this current revolution. I mean, besides the fact that the Cuban government is directly responsible for oppressing people to their breaking point, the thing that started this current revolution in Cuba, I like to call it, was a song, a hip hop song, because black artists in Cuba are being especially abused by their government. And Cuba took COVID restrictions to the next level. People aren't allowed to leave the house in more than groups of two at a time. And this has been going on for almost two years now. And they just keep this going. And so if you leave the house, you're automatically considered somebody who's going to try to start a rebellion. So if you leave the house just to take a stroll with your friends on a hot summer afternoon where there's two or three of you, the Cuban Black Berets will come behind you and start beating you. And so so anybody who's exercising their right to free speech right now, for example, is also being charged with public endangerment in particular because of the COVID pandemic. Yeah. So there's a lot that's going on there that these people, what I have never heard ever from a protester in Cuba, from the song that inspired this revolution, or from us who are protesting here in the United States, I have never once heard us say, give us an easier way to send remittances. Yeah. Give us an easier yeah. way to send medicine. <laughs> give us an easier way, easier way to, we have never said, this is about food. This is about shortages. And yet, In Miami itself, the Cuban capital of the world outside of Cuba, CBS Miami this morning publishes a report and it mentions the Cuban protests and the end of the report says Cubans on the island started protesting on July 11th because of food and medicine shortages. And it even even mentioned a lack of COVID-19 vaccines. So here's a real fun nugget. A few months ago, the Cuban government announced, in fact, The Cuban government, I believe, announced that they had their own COVID vaccine before there was one even on the market in the United States. Oh, really? (laughs) And they also announced that they had plenty for everybody. (laughs) Wow. So somehow... They were clearly showing up. ...shortage of COVID vaccines, and they haven't had a shortage of COVID vaccines. 
well, how would that occur? <laughs> it's just an opportunity to sweep it under the rug. That's right. And I'm sorry if I'm talking over everybody. If somebody wants to jump in and has something to say, go ahead. Oh, no, you're, you're, we're enjoying this. And at least I am. Or, well, enjoyment in the sense of learning. <laughs> David, I've got a question. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. Spike Cohen posted on Twitter that the, I'm not sure exactly what you would call it. I guess the the rule that says that Americans can't go to yes. Cuba. He said that that's just an executive order that he could actually revoke that with a stroke of a pen. Like, Yes, he could. So we'll start with the chief of the Department of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, who was born in Havana, whose family had to escape Cuba who was granted asylum in the United States by basically the same fashion that Cubans are seeking to get today, uh, the ones that need to escape because they're being persecuted. He posted, I believe it was on Twitter, and he gave a press conference, and he repeated the Kamala Harris line of, do not come. And it was worse than that because he said, if you establish a credible case of political asylum or of political persecution, we will still not bring you to the United States. We'll settle you in a third country. And oh, that's great. We're talking about people who have no idea what is going to happen to them in the next few hours. They take to the open sea to escape that, and they have no clue if they'll be sent back to Cuba because the U.S. hasn't defined what a credible case of political asylum is, and they'll get murdered when they get back or tortured or something else, or they'll go to a country that they have no clue where it is. It could be Venezuela. Wow. Or Africa, for that matter. Or, or Nicaragua. Mean, or anywhere who, else. It could be just wherever they say, okay, we're yeah. accepting Cubans right now. And Cuba, Cubans already know that Cuba is a major exporter of communism around the world. Mm -hmm. So they're afraid if they go anywhere other than the United States, they'll just be sent back or they'll just yeah. be murdered somewhere by Cuban officials. I mean, even at our rally yesterday, which... I'll tell you the story about this rally first. <laughs> so there was this political rally yesterday in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And the people who ran the rally are city councilmen, and they're all Democrats, but they're all Cubans. So they wanted to have a rally in solidarity with the Cuban people, but it was very solemn and it was just political speeches. And the first guy who took the stage said, now I want to remind my Cuban brothers not to call for any act of violence against the Cuban government. And... <laughs> It was just be, oh. <laughs> just be so irresponsible. And I'm like, the Cuban government right now is engaged in a genocide. And for me, as a reformed Christian, I feel that these people do have a justified case of self-defense. Yeah. And here's these politicians who are like, well, I'm just going to make my showing so that my constituency stays with me and doesn't go to any of these off, you know, off the script rallies. And it just <laughs> felt it just felt like Joe Biden or somebody from the DNC called the New Jersey Cuban Democrats and said, you better get your people back on the script. Yeah. That's just what it felt like. Wow. So me and my real true counter-revolutionary activists that we're all a group that uh, we have our own WhatsApp chat. We, we do these, you know, big marches in, in Manhattan. We tried to take the microphone at the end of their rally, and the guy pushed us away. He said, "No one like that though." He's like, "We're not gonna get start. We're not gonna start doing this." All right? And he shoves her out of the way. So she went and she pulled a huge speaker out of her backpack and her own microphone and set it up right in front of their stage. And all the Cubans who wanted to really rally for Cuban liberty circled around us, and we gave our speeches. Oh, that's awesome. We just totally ruined their little political event. It was just so beautiful. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> we just did that yesterday. Uh, and the reason I'm telling you this story is because while we were there, there was Cuban state security. Very easily identifiable. I worked for 10 years or almost 10 years in international baseball inciting defections of Cuban baseball players. <laughs> I'd go, yeah, I'm, I'm crazy. I would go up to them at international tournaments and I would hand them what you would call a micro note. Uh, it's a piece of paper with lines and I, you basically write two or three lines in between each line of the paper, roll it up into the ink of a pen and hand it to the baseball player after he, after he signs an autograph for you. And <laughs> inside are instructions on how to escape. <laughs> oh, wow. That's how he knows Mexico really well because he will get Cuban ball players from Mexico when <laughs> the Cubans were playing. Yes, I know That's Mexico brilliant. very well because uh, Mexico was one of the places that I went to 
do uh, do counter revolutionary acts. Hey, you guys want a Mexico story? So here <laughs> I am in Mexico at a bar, and I'm I'm in Mexico to help Cuban baseball players escape and to incite defections. And the entire Cuban state security for the event is at a bar drunk. So I go to this bar, and apparently this is the bar where Fidel and Che Guevara made their big hit off to go to Cuba and start the revolution. Wow. So it's all commies. Like there's Cuban flags outside. I was like, oh, this will be interesting. So I go inside and they didn't recognize me. They were all drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so I sit next to this one guy who's Cuban state security. He actually pulled out his ID card. He says, I live here in Mexico, but I'm Cuban state security. I'm like, bro, you're drunk. Why are you admitting this to me? But anyway, I was like, I was like, okay, let me tell you who I am. And I knew I was in enemy territory and I really didn't care. You know, I, I was like 20 years old. I didn't know just how soft the human body is. You know, you could, <laughs> all I have to do is stab me and it's over. But, uh, <laughs> but he's drinking. I was like, hey, I'll have a drink with you and you, you can get to know an American. And he's like, okay, that sounds interesting. And I start talking. I was like, you know, you guys are actually here in Mexico to stop me. I'm literally the guy that you're here to stop. And he's like, oh, well, then we can't talk to each other anymore. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we can. It was like, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the classic uh, Steve McQueen movie, uh, Great Escape. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And uh, where, where he's, he's, the one guy is bribing the German guard. He's like, uh -huh. here, have some chocolate. Here's some butter. You hungry? And the guy's like, I have to report this. He's like, no, 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 you don't have to report anything. We're friends. Here, have some chocolate. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'm buying the guy drinks because he's broke. <laughs> and here he, he has a diplomatic immunity in this country and he works for the Cuban embassy and he's broke. And I'm like, bro, your country doesn't take care of you. But, <laughs> but, but he, he kind of came around to being friendly with me. But at the end of the night, we parted ways. It wasn't on good terms. But I came out of the parking lot and he was waiting there for me. And he says, listen, uh, you're really the only one who's sober enough to do this for me. Could you help me start my car by pushing it? <laughs> That's fantastic. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll start your car. And it was like this... Very common in Mexico. It was like a mid-80s car in 2007 Mexico. Wow. Everybody in Mexico at this point has Fords and Chevys from at least this decade. <laughs> and he's wow. telling me to push his car. He works at the embassy. He has diplomatic license plates and I'm pushing his car to start. Wow. So they don't even care about their people in the exterior. They don't really take care of them unless they're higher up. Wow. So that's my that's one of my Mexico stories. It's a fun one. <laughs> that's, that's pretty fun. good. That's pretty good. I, I enjoyed it. I am trying to get people to a rally at the United Nations tomorrow. We will be there at noon in New York City. That's four hour drive for me each way. Ooh. But I have been going back and forth to Manhattan uh, and to Northern New Jersey to recruit people. Yesterday, I was in my van here. If you can see, it says Viva Cuba Libre right on it. Yeah. And I've got Cuban flag hanging from the door. You know, I've got freedom for Cuba written on the other side. On the back, it says communism is evil, freedom for Cuba. And I get honks all over the country. Like everywhere I go, people are like raising their fists. Yeah, yeah, freedom for Cuba. Of course. They have no idea. Like the American press is really trying to hide what's happening in Cuba because if the Cuban socialist system fails, all of the lies of academia fall with it. Mm -hmm. And Cuba has exported communist ideology to American academia at such a level that every single American student right now romanticizes Cuba in some form or other. And it's all just based on lies. Yeah. And so if that falls apart, their whole narrative for pushing toward a Cuban model of socialism falls apart with it. Yeah, I, I was right. telling that the Berlin Wall is falling in Latin America. Finally. Yeah, wow. Cuba falling is definitely, you know, the Iron Curtain falling 2.0. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Cuba, Cuba is still basically a Soviet satellite and they, be mm -hmm. they basically became the Soviet Union and now they have their own satellites. So in Venezuela alone, there are 20,000, and this is as of five years ago, 20,000 Cuban officials who work there in various missions. Wow. And in Venezuela alone, it is required by law, and it's not necessarily enforced, but party members do try to keep up on this, that every single official position or every single position that you could have, you know, you're a desk clerk or you're a cashier or you're something else, every single profession has to have at least one Cuban in the immediate office. 
Wow. And by the way, and in El Salvador, there's Venezuelans from the go uh, from government officials in, from Venezuela in El Salvador. So this is something that spreads. It's not yes. super localized. It's completely yes. spread out. So, so what they do is they, they force you to have this person in your office to continuously propagandize you, to continuously keep tabs on you, and to make sure that you as a professional are developing in a way that's fitting of a communist. They, they do yeah. that in China, too. Yeah. Well, yep. Cuba has this way. Cuba is basically, they do this. In exchange, they get to plunder the precious resources of countries that are poorer than them. So Cuba will go to Africa and Cuba will go to Venezuela and they'll say, well, all these people are doctors. And they'll say, I'll give you doctors because you don't have any doctors and you'll give me barrels of oil. It's human trafficking. Wow. Mm. Wow. And so, and so a Cuban is not allowed to determine their own destiny. At least a doctor is not allowed to until they've finished one of those missions. So if they defect during one of those missions, their family suffers because they're not allowed to go on those missions with their family members. And they're not allowed to leave the country for any other reason for their own purposes until they've at least completed one of those missions. So not everybody who's doing that is doing it to propagandize the Venezuelan people or the people of Nicaragua or Mozambique or wherever they send people. But it is very insidious. The Cuban socialist system has completely infected every aspect of most of Latin American life. And it is definitely being seen here as well. The solutions that this government has had, I'll get back to Alejandro Mayorkas, was to blockade anybody who was attempting to go to Cuba to even to provide aid. And he's from Cuba and he's also telling people not to escape. So he's telling people not to try to help people who are trying to escape. He's creating the conditions for a political genocide. Wow. And anybody who's out there saying that the Cuban people are in the streets asking for vaccines, and once vaccines arrive, they should probably just shut up. The problem is solved. Those people have blood on their hands because the Cuban people need, want and need liberty from the communist regime that has oppressed and tortured and terrorized them for the over the course of seven decades. That's... Absolutely wild. So I, I know that we have limited time with you. So I want to get to sort of it as best we can, action items, if you will, for those of us who are just sitting there. How do we help? I run a memes page. So I believe very <laughs> firmly in the power of being the counter propaganda. I think right now it yeah. is very important to be the counter propaganda. Another thing I think is very, very important is for Americans to recognize if you see the hard shift left in the United States, most of that is coming from academia. And most of those people are preaching Cuban socialism in the schools. Mm -hmm. The fight against the Cuban Communist Party is an American fight, just as much as the Venezuelan right. fight or a Cuban fight. This is our fight. We have this yeah. communist system infected our country right now. And if we don't take to the streets to help these Cubans get rid of this, then we're in for the exact same thing as Venezuela. Yeah. And they're our neighbors. Like these are people who, you know, you've, you walk down the street anywhere in the United States and you're going to run into a Hispanic neighbor somewhere. And any number of those are, will have either Cuban heritage or at least well, are related or there's to them. Peruvians. Uh, my, my own yeah. grandparents, uh, my, were, uh, Wycliffe Bible translators in Peru in the 70s and 80s during the time of the Shining Path terrorist group. And the Shining Path was the communist rebels of Peru. And they mm -hmm. were terrorized themselves. They would come home and they would tell us stories when they would give their mission report. They would tell us stories about the Shining Path and about the people that they knew that were in movements to oppose them and how they didn't fear anything and about how they prayed to God. And I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional because. No, it's my grandmother passed away on July 11th. Our condolences to you, sir. And July 11th was the day they rose up in Cuba. Yeah. And my whole life, I have believed in liberty. And my my Christian grandparents taught me about the evils of communism. And the, the Shining Path was funded and armed by the Cuban government. Right. And I just know it's just it, it's a providential event. It's just it's a fortuitous thing and I, that my grandmother goes to be with God and the Cuban people rise up. It's just a beautiful thing. Yeah, man. Amen. And I, I haven't really made a lot of these connections until I've been thinking about it. I, I haven't because they rose up on the 11th. I haven't had a lot of time to reflect even about my own grandmother's story. This is the space. That's why I wanted to bring you. 
Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, thanks. A uh, little uh, therapy with my uh, Christian libertarian. <laughs> so, so here's another thing: outside of the media and the government and academia, is social media. I flew one of our best activists. His name is Diego Rivera from Texas. I flew him all the way to Manhattan to be in our rally on Saturday. And they just deleted all of his social media accounts. Oh my oh. gosh. What? Because all he's been doing is sharing videos of the atrocities that are happening in Cuba. And then go to me. There was a, a video of Cuban police showing up with rebar in their hands. And I mean, by the hundreds of police officers in busloads to go and beat and lacerate the protesters. And all I wrote was, Quemen la guagua esta which means burn those buses. And I was immediately hit with a seven-day ban. When I went to appeal the ban, they gave me 30. They don't want us spreading the news about what's happening in Cuba, especially social media. And now they're just outright deleting people's accounts over it. I do actually have to go. Yes, sir. And what I'd like to say is, if you hear about a Cuban protest in your town or you hear some sort of news about Cuba, they're probably not telling the truth. And even these solutions that the Biden administration is offering right now, none of it has any teeth. And all it's done, it's meant to pacify anybody who is a Cuban on the left side of American politics and get them to drop out of the protest so that our numbers will dwindle. So take this fight against communism very seriously because this is happening in real time. They're torturing people. They're even here in the United States spying on our actions. And they have their own agents in social media, in academia, in political places to move things in the direction of Cuban socialism. And you do not want this. Wow. Amen to that, brother. Well, we understand you got to go. Thank you so much for joining us. And we do really, really appreciate it. Keep in touch. And whatever we can do to help you to spread the word, we'll be, we'll be here for you, man. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Viva Cuba Libre. Viva Cuba Libre. Libre. Thank you, sir. (laughs) All right. So as uh, as David exits our uh, playing field here, we just want to give a shout out again to Liberty Memes and what they're doing over there. Pay attention to what we're going to be posting because I'm sure that Aaron will will be sharing stuff on our social media and we'll be doing the best we can to be supporting these efforts because this is obviously something that is really significant to what is the near future of this entire world. Yeah. So guys, before we kind of close off with any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave us with. Gosh, I really appreciate David coming on here and just pointing out how relevant Cuba's fight is for America. Mm-hmm. Aside from the fact that you have lots of people across the world protesting COVID restrictions and lockdowns and things like that, which are very meaningful and we should support. I think it's very easy to sort of dismiss Cuba for being small and, you know, always have having been in trouble in one way or the other. And he's saying, David's saying, no, this is, this is way more important to Americans than Americans realize. Yeah. And so I think we need to pay attention to that and speak up for them. To give you guys a context, it really is a fight for all of Latin America. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All Spanish speaking, uh, well, even including Brazil, because this is spread out everywhere. Just so you guys uh, understand what the context is, that that's just the center of, of the problem. But all yeah. of that Latin America depends upon what happens. So we, we're literally looking at the fall of the, of the wall of Berlin in Latin, for Latin America. Super, super important. Yeah. Yeah. It's really incredible. And and I just, it really strikes me to consider, you know, I mean, having lived in Texas for the bulk of my life and knowing lots and lots and lots of Hispanic people there with Cuban heritage and also living in Florida for a time and meeting people there of similar quality and of location. I mean, my heart goes out to everybody there and I hope that we can be supportive in, in whatever way that we can toward making liberty happen in this regard. So I think we're going to, we're going to call that, you know, this is our one topic of the night. So we're glad that you guys stuck around for watching this, or if you're listening to it on the podcast, thank you very much for, for joining us for the podcast as well. With that, we will see you next time here at good news, bad news, the libertarian Christian Institute Roundtable. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.